In a previous workshop, we looked at separating two common small waders, Dunlin and Knot. As mentioned then, Dunlin is an extremely common and widespread small wader, and it should be used as the yardstick when considering other similar wader species. Here we are going to look at another two species which are often confused with Dunlin, Curlew Sandpiper and Sanderling. Sanderling is the commonest of the two and is a similar size to Dunlin, ever so slightly bigger in the body but with a shorter bill and legs it looks more compact. In all plumages Sanderling can be identified by its unique feeding behaviour. Groups of birds run quickly along the edge of the surf on beaches following the receding waves picking morsels from the surface as they go, before running even more quickly back up the beach as the next wave comes in. Their little black legs run ceaselessly and the birds can give the impression of being clockwork toys. No other British wader habitually feeds like this. If an individual is encountered away from this typical shoreline habitat, however, how can we possibly identify it? There is one diagnostic feature which, if you can see it, will clinch the ID a complete lack of a hind toe on the foot. But this is very rarely going to be a helpful feature in the field, so how can we use plumage to help us? Sanderling is a frequent species with around 16,000 birds wintering. In winter plumage the bird is strikingly white and it is this paleness which will allow Sanderling to be picked out from other wader species. It has pale silver grey above and shining white below. The head is very pale and the throat and chest are white with a very small silver collar. The stout straight black bill, black legs, wingtips and eye all stand out against the overall paleness. In addition there is very often a noticeable dark bend to the wing, an elbow if you wish, which at least some birds in a group will show, even if on others the white breast feathers are temporarily obscuring it. In flight, again the very pale plumage is striking, allowing sandling to be easily picked out from other species in flight. In all plumages, sandling show a broad black leading edge to the wing with a broad white wing bar, giving the strong impression to me of a pied wing or one completely edged in black. Young birds are rarely encountered, except in late summer when they first arrive. These birds are still white below and with the dark elbow, but the plumage above is heavily spangled in black and white and there are buff tones, especially around the head and collar. This plumage is quickly molted, however, and first winter birds in the field are basically identical to adult in winter plumage. The numbers around our coasts fall in spring, but there is a small pulse of birds moving through in May on passage back to their Arctic breeding grounds. These individuals will be in the striking breeding plumage, retaining the white belly, but with varying amounts of orangey rufous red feathering on the head, neck and back, and scattered through the wing feathers. Curly sandpiper is a much scarcer bird, with normally fewer than a thousand recorded each year. They are rarely found in the winter, but the main months in Britain are in late summer, with the highest numbers in August and September, before the birds travel on to sub-Saharan, Africa or even further for the winter. In some ways, curly sandpiper is similar to Dunlin, particularly in winter plumage. Here, structure will help you. And curly sandpipers help us by often associating with Dunlin, allowing direct comparison. Overall, curly sandpiper gives a more elegant impression. The body is ever so slightly bigger than that of a Dunlin, but the legs, neck, wingtips and bill are longer, giving a very different silhouette. The bill, ironically, although longer and more downcurved than on a Dunlin, is not always the best feature to rely on. Some long-billed Dunlin closely approach short-billed curly sandpipers. Instead, look at the overall impression. Curly sandpipers will often be in deeper water with their necks outstretched. The chests appear more rounded and paler than on Dunlin, and there is a much more prominent supercilium. Young birds are frequently encountered, especially towards the autumn, and these share the same elegant proportions as the adults, but with more heavily marked uppers, lacking any hint of white braces on the back. A beautiful peachy wash on the front, but clean white underparts, and never with any black markings below. Young birds share with the adults the supercilium. Numbers drop right off by the beginning of November, 
but there is a very small number that pass back through on their way to their Siberian breeding grounds in mid-May. As with other waders at this time, birds will be in their very attractive breeding plumage, with brick red upper parts, chest and belly. The wing feathers are heavily spangled with white, black and red, and the head will have varying amounts of white between the eye and bill. Returning adults in late summer usually have some breeding plumage feathers remaining, and presence of these red feathers on the belly and chest in particular will mark these birds out from nearby Dunlin, although this uneven blotching can be confusing if you are unfamiliar with curly sandpiper. In flight, curly sandpiper is similar to Dunlin, with marginally more white in the outer wings, but individuals can be picked out from amongst the Dunlin in a flock by their fully white rumps, a feature shared only with one very small, very rare American vagrant.